Hello, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Ariana. Welcome to stage three. It's great to see you all. Uh, let's have some hellos in the chat just to see who's online today. Great to see you. Really appreciate it. So today we have a very special treat for you, mentoring and training experts, a cognitive science approach by Dwayne Dunstan. Just a note before we start from our sponsors. So we would like to thank our sponsors for supporting the event today. Uh, we've got Exonius, MongoDB, Juniper Networks, Corelight, Google, We Hack Purple, Bridge Crew. Uh, thank you to all of our sponsors. I do apologize for my technical difficulties and not being able to show you the slide. Right, so let's move on to the event of today. We've got uh, an expert with us today. So Dwayne is an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Champlain College in Burlington, Vermont. He has been in the industry for over 24 years, working in both the education and government sectors. He focuses on risk management, cryptography, security education, and using technology for social change. In addition to teaching and consulting, Dwayne is a member of the Vermont Cyber Patriots Programme. He's completed his doctoral coursework at Northeastern University and has started working on his dissertation. So I'm really looking forward to this talk today. I think that's probably enough from me for now. I'm going to pass it over. Welcome, Jane. Thanks, Ariana. I appreciate it. And welcome, folks. <clears throat> First, we want to really thank our sponsors for helping to put on this event. <clears throat> and you got a quick rundown of my bio. My focus is on cognition and learning. So I want to go ahead and define two key concepts that we're going to use for this presentation. A novice. So when we're going into something new, we typically have the, the faculties and the wherewithal to learn. And those include critical thinking and, and problem solving. But mimicking is also really important because we have all, we have naturally learned to mimic what other people do, and that's who how we become who we are and stay safe as well. And an expert, when I use the term expert, I mean someone that has domain specific knowledge in a particular field. So they have a lot of knowledge about that topic. Folks like who do reverse engineering on a daily basis or threat in intelligence, they are an expert because they have domain specific knowledge about that field. This talk is a follow-up from my presentation at Diane Initiative from last year, where I, I talked about a case against Google it, a cognitive science approach. And at the end of that presentation, someone just made a comment that really stood out to me. And what I'm going to talk about, well, what I talked about was cognitive load theory and cognitive apprenticeship theory and how you can use those for mentoring uh, novices or for, to help someone develop any kind of expertise. For example, in a presentation, our, our novice, if you will, was a, a Windows system admin who wanted to learn Linux administration and Linux security as well. During the Q&A, somebody stated, this does not seem to scale. And th th that's, that, that comment stuck with me. And so this is a follow-up to explain how that, that statement that someone made, and if you're listening today, thank you for that comment, uh, well, I'm going to talk about how these principles still apply in some ways, but not completely, because of this thing called the expert reversal effect. In cognitive load theory, the expert reversal effect occurs or, or means that methods of learning that apply to novices don't apply to experts, because that learning could actually be detrimental for them, especially if they're in college or in a, some kind of um, training program and they're getting some kind of, some type of grade for it. It can actually undo the the schemas, the long term knowledge that they've built up over time. So that statement does have some validity by all means. So these principles of of, of novices learning can apply to experts in some in some some ways. What experts need, though, are they need coaching and they need feedback and advice on what they want to learn. And that's what I want to talk about. And there are some cognitive apprenticeship principles that apply to this coaching and feedback. So first of all, when you, like in school, you 
get a grade or you do an assignment, you get a grade, you get feedback on how well you did or how well you didn't do. That's different from advice because when someone gives advice, they're providing you a response and an opinion or, or on ways to improve your performance. So if you didn't do well on a test, they give you advice on what you can do next time to do even better or allow you to resubmit so that you can demonstrate that you've learned from the advice that was given. So those are the main two differences between feedback and advice. One is a response, the other is more action oriented. So how do we train experts? What, what do mentors need to know? Generally, deliberate practice is what you want. And I'm pausing there because of the redundancy effect. <laughs> Um, in cognitive load theory, you have audio, which you're listening to me talk right now, and you're reading something, and your working memory is very limited. And if I talk and read the slide while you're trying to read the slide, it can cause you to not focus on what I'm saying. So that's why I get these pauses periodically. So this deliberate practice is a repetitive, willful attempt to change or improve on your performance. Like Harpreet's... Um, uh, uh, presentation on, on purple teaming. When the teams come together and they find weaknesses and a person see that they're weak in something, they can deliberately set out to improve themselves in that. And, and that's different than just someone who's a general practitioner. A general practitioner performs a task and they may refresh their skills, but they don't willfully do something over and over and over to get better and better and better and better at it. So that deliberate practice is how we train and mentor experts. And uh, the, the, the learning environment has to be specific to the person based on what it is they want to learn. So that's why it can be sometimes difficult to find the right training for an expert, because what they need the most help with may not be available. And some things we're going to talk about is ways that we can, we can allow this to still happen. So to use myself as an example, I just learned, excuse me, I just got my certificate from certification in MITRE's um, attack cyber threat intelligence. Now, I could download reports, threat, threat intel reports. I can download how a piece of malware works, and I can map that to the MITRE attack framework. I can do that if I wanted to. But what I did is I got a mentor who can do something different, someone who can allow me, excuse me, someone who can help me really learn how to apply the MITRE ATT&CK framework to different scenarios. That's my deliberate practice. I want to get better at what, I'm, at what I'm doing. I did really well with raw data. I didn't do so well when I tried it out with the uh, threat intel report, where it's like a lot of details about how the attackers or the malware works. So I, I'm, I'm asking him for help and he's providing me reports and then I'm meeting with him so we can go over those results together. So he's not just going to provide me feedback, but provide me advice on how to improve a specific skill set that I'm not developing. So if I don't understand how a specific type of attack works and I keep mapping it or missing it, he's there to help me and I can keep practicing that over and over and over until I get it. More than that, is that the process I'm going to go through is a bit more demanding. So deliberate practice engages someone in a cognitively hard task, essentially giving them a really hard problem, something that's going to require them to really uh, push them to, the, to their limits. And so, you know, if you heard Alyssa's um, keynote this morning, one thing she really talked about is that the mentor needs to know their, their mentees so that they can determine what's the best material I can give to them based on their skill level. And then the feedback and advice is super important so that I can improve and get better at what I want to do. So, okay, Dwayne, you're doing really well now with mapping to MITRE. Now, can you apply this to a industrial control system? Can you apply this to an education organization? So it's, it's pushing me um, to, to take my skills to a different level. I'm not just downloading reports and mapping just for skill development, I'm doing it to become really good at it in different different fields. So that requires repeated practice and repeated meetings with my mentor to help ensure that I'm fine tuning those skills I need the most help with. 
And when I make mistakes, I need to, uh, uh, when I make mistakes, my mentor is there to help me correct those so I don't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Now, some of you may have heard of this 10,000 hours of practice makes you an expert. But what, a lot of the academic literature is showing that it's not the number of hours that determines if you're an expert. Because I've been doing this for 24 years now, and I've got more than 10,000 hours. But if your quality of your experience is not very good, then the quantity doesn't really matter. And so it has to do with people who spend the time in deliberate practice and the number of hours they spend in that deliberate practice. So if I spend a lot of time trying to understand industrial control systems and then trying to apply the MITRE attack framework to the industrial control system, then that is what my, my expertise starts to develop from that. But it's not so much the number of hours, because again, I can download reports until I retire, but not do anything with that knowledge. So the number of hours is not that important, more so than the work I'm doing. There's also this concept of dynamic practice. And a good mentor who knows their mentee really well can ensure that if I get a really hard problem, like if he tells me next week, okay, Dwayne, I want you to apply this MITRE attack framework to an industrial control system. I don't know much about industrial control systems. So he may say, okay, that's too hard for you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you something a bit easier. Here, apply this MITRE attack to a university. I have some framework to work with there, and I have some knowledge about the education environment, and so it's a bit easier for me. And then over time, I can progress to industrial control systems. And it's really important that the mentor allow time for feedback. So when I present my report next week to my mentor, and he looks at it and says, okay, Dwayne, you missed these here, or you said it is this, but it's actually this over here. Why did you choose this option? And I, and I can explain, I can reflect on why I chose that option. And then that allows time for my mentor to say, oh, I see why, but it's actually this here for these reasons. And so once again, I'm getting feedback and I'm getting advice on how to improve that the next time around. And if I meet up with my mentor, you know, I don't know, three times a month, for example, just, just theoretically three times a month, and he sees I'm not doing well, I keep messing up on that part, then he's going to give me specific reports that focuses on that, that weak skill that I have. But again, that comes from your mentor and mentee relationship being really strong, having strong communication with each other. And uh, this applies to cognitive apprenticeship theory. So dynamic practice is cognitive low theory because a, a cognitively demanding task means that I'm not going to do very well. And so I took a step back so you don't get unmotivated. Take a step back and try this here. <clears throat> and within cognitive apprenticeships, what it does, the, 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 the central principle, the central uh, thesis, if you will, for cognitive apprenticeships is a, a, a cognitive apprenticeship is just like a regular apprenticeship like we know it. You have a master, you have a, a um, student. Except it makes thinking visible. You, you provide feedback to your mentee. You allow the mentee to reflect. You observe what the mentee is doing. So that's cognitive apprenticeship theory that can still apply to an expert. So what do we do to allow deliberate practice, especially when expertise, expert, expert development, it, it, it can be hard to come by because again, you go to an advanced training class, an advanced boot camp, but the problems that are presented to you are too easy. So you don't really develop the skill you were hoping to. And a lot of employee employers want their um, employers to, employees to take training so they can keep their skills up to date and apply that knowledge to, to where they work. So something that training providers can do, those commercial companies that pay for that, um, you know, you go to their site or they come to your site, 
is provide case studies that you that they've heard about from industry partners and recreate those and allow the students to work on those to see how they solve that problem. And then after they've worked through it and, and, and demonstrated their knowledge, then you, the, the um, training provider can give them the report by the you know, FireEye or, or Mendia, for example, and how they were able to uncover whatever the issue was. In the case of uh, Mandiant, they may have an incident response um, or a, a malware infection that's recreated in, a, in the um, training. And then you see their report to see how they solve the problem. And if you see any weaknesses, something you didn't pick up, then that's a skill that you can now incorporate into your deliberate practice. Oh, I need to learn more about interpreting PCAPs or network capture that you can load into Wireshark or I need to uh, get better at identifying the behavior of malware. So case studies can help with that deliberate practice for, um, for experts. Also community-driven hard problems. And again, when I say hard problems, I mean something that really requires a heavy cognitive um, demand to, to solve. Novel attacks that people experience. If you follow folks on Twitter, you often read about um, these reports of people who are uncovering these really novel attacks. And something that could be done is people could put together or recreate that attack and, and allow people to work on it themselves to see how they did. And then they can read the final report because not only is the person who's doing the, uh, who's, who, who is, who was attempting to uh, complete the attack learning, but they may report something that the person who um, submitted the, who, who recreated that attack learned. So learning can happen in, in, in any environment really. For example, the HoneyNet project that, where they used to post um, the PCAPs and the activity of an attacker, and then the community wrote a, uh, community pe people all over the world, anywhere, could download that, that case and then write a report on it. But even more than that is that the HoneyNet team reviewed the reports and the top three won some kind of award or whatever it was. But the benefit of it is that another expert or team of experts is reviewing what people did and they post those top reports so that other people can learn from them as well. So what we could create is a community of da a database of hard problems in different fields, threat hunting, instant response, threat intelligence, um, reverse engineering. And if anybody in my students, our students at Champlain College can tell you, if you don't follow Binary Zone <laughs> on Twitter, you should. He gives really hard problems, for example. And people can recreate those um, situations that they've been involved with and post them for public consumption and for public analysis as well. So that people who are, who, who are looking for that deliberate practice in a specific skill, more than likely will find something if they have a broad database in which to choose from. And then this concept of worked examples. Worked examples is probably one of the most effective methods for training novices. That's where the person who's teaching show them step-by-step step how to perform a task instead of saying, go Google it, for example, or, you know, no, that's not the right report. Where'd you find the information from? Show them how to do it. And in many cases, experts still need some guidance. Like our, my fictitious Windows admin needed some guidance on how to transfer the knowledge from Windows over to Linux. So there's still some aspects of, of teaching novices that are appropriate for, the ex for experts, but it requires understanding the individual experts you're working with and what their needs are as well. So thank you folks for attending. And again, this was a follow-up from my last, uh, from the last conference from last year to address the, the comment about the case against Google it not scaling. Well, hopefully this has demonstrated how you can, well, one way in which you can help experts develop, especially if they start to get bored <laughs> or they need to hone a skill. Um, you know, hopefully we can start a project where a database of hard problems can be recreated and people can can jump in and, and work on those. You're welcome to follow me on Twitter. Currently this month, I'm talking about um, how to document a system security plan 
and I'm using the CIS controls to explain what you should document based on their control. So feel free to join join me or, or follow me and um, get access to that content. And some references from things I've talked about um, for this topic. All right, Ariana, are there any, any questions popped up? Hi, yes, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk. That was incredibly insightful in such a short amount of time as well. So I'm just going to look at the audience. I, does anyone have any questions for Dwayne on anything that you've heard or listened to? All right. So is there a specific Twitter account for binary zone? Yes. Um, he spelled the O is a zero. So binary zone together, the O is a zero. <laughs> cool. Binary zone. Right. I've put that in the chat. So you should have find it there. Cool. So another question we have, is there a name for this behavior and how to combat it? I really want to learn this new technology, but I'd rather watch a two-hour presentation than sit down and use the tech on my own. Well, yes. Um, you know, in, in general, uh, people may be intimidated to, to ask questions or not know how to ask questions. So it's good to watch a video or like go to YouTube and learn things so that you can kind of do things on your own, first of all, or, or determine what your current skill level is as well. Um, so wanting to learn on your own and watch a presentation, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If that's how you learn, that's how you learn. I agree. So I don't have anything. Audience, if you have more questions, please send them in. But I do have a question here, actually. So you talk, you mentioned having mentors, and you said that uh, deliberate practice makes your progress visible. So you've got these check-in points with, with this mentor. How do you keep that momentum going between those visits? Because I imagine they're not very regular. Well, I just started with this. I just got my cert like two weeks ago, I guess now. So what we're doing is we meet via a Slack channel. And uh, before we agree to meet again, then he'll, he's gonna send me a report to work on, and then I'm gonna map it and then send it to him before we meet up, and then we go over it together. So it's really about setting that next meeting before we end, of, end that meeting. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you very, very much. Mm -hmm. All right, audience, I think that's our time today. What I'm gonna do is, I'm going to post in this chat a uh, link to a survey. So what we'd, what we'd love to have, and it's really helpful for Dwayne, it's useful for us at Diana Initiative, please send us feedback. If you've enjoyed this talk, not if, tell us you've enjoyed this talk. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is in the chat. And of course, it seems like an obvious question, but just to reiterate, how can we get in touch with you, Dwayne, if we have any questions because we've run out of time today? Oh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. Or my email is my last name, Dunston, D-U-N-S-T-O-N, at champlain.edu. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, folks. All right. Take care.